apologise for that, Mr. Crowe, to the other council. I should have handed that down this morning, but I'm afraid pressure of other matters meant that I wasn't able to do so. Um, I'm very grateful, my lord. Um, could I just um, pick up a couple of loose points before continuing? Um, <coughs> My Lord Justice uh, Longmore um, and, and mentioned the respondent's notice in Lunro. Rather than going back to that, could I just give two page references which, which deal with it? In, in, so it's Lunro in the Court of Appeal, uh, which is tab 9 in the First Authorities Fund. And the respondent's notice is mentioned at page 481E, and it's dealt with by Lord Justice Dillon uh, between 490B and 491C. Um, our, our reading of that, for what it's worth, is that he was dealing with a, a, a point on factual causation rather than any principle of law. Um, the second point I just wanted to mention, if, 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 if this does matter, um, <clears throat> I was pressed entirely understandably by, by um, the Master of the Rolls on, on the extent to which we are departing from our, uh, our written skeleton. Uh, and without getting into um, uh, drafting the points, um, I just, again, I'm not going to go to it, but if, if, if in due course you have a chance to look back at paragraph 12 <coughs> of our skeleton, the essence of what I, uh, I, we are now offering orally is there, to regard the second sentence of para 51 as reflecting an invariable dealing requirement additional to the other elements of the tort is a misreading of OVG. The second sentence of para 51 is simply an elaboration of how the requirement identified in 47A applies in dealing cases <coughs> such as Douglas and Hello, RCA Pollard, and Eisen, Oren, and Redbox. So um, I, I accept that, that the point is put a little more broadly, of talking about dealing cases generally elsewhere. But, but I, th I think the essence of, of, of the distinction we're trying to draw uh, was certainly intended. Uh, I, think, I think the way you were developing it by the end of your submissions just before the short adjournment was that the... Um, is that really that uh, what Lord Hoffman was talking about in the second paragraph of 51, I think, uh, is really the license case he goes yes. on to explain. It's yes. not really the Hello yes. type case. Yeah. It's the license yeah. type yeah. case. Well, as we'll see, um, uh, he actually resolves the Hello case by aligning it to the licensing cases. So um, all I, the, 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 just to finish with, with OBG, um, yes. 52, 53, 54 are dealing with the licensing cases, and th they are expressing what I was putting to you. It wasn't, wasn't our gloss on those licensing cases. It's what Lord Hoffman uh, says about them uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, the absence of, of, of an interference with the copyright holders' um, uh, 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 freedom to deal with the licensee. Um, and then if we can carry on then, so if, if you've put it away, it's bundle two of the authorities, tab 14. And I was going to move, uh, finish with para 56, which we started, so page, page 34 of the report. <coughs> para 56, I think we got as far as uh, Mogul Steamship and then um, uh, uh, debated something else. But he, he carries on saying, largely left um, such rules to be laid down by Parliament. In my opinion, the courts should be similarly cautious in extending a tour. Sorry, where, where are you? So in 56, 56. we just, we, I read halfway through oh, as yes. far as the reference to Mogul Steamship. Yes. And then he says, in my opinion, the courts should be similarly cautious in extending a tort which was designed only to enforce basic standards of civilized behavior in economic competition between traders or between employers and labor. And if you want a, a, an encapsulation of the rationale as he sees it, and why we say that allowing the tort in this case entirely conforms to that rationale, uh, that is a helpful uh, description. A tort designed to enforce basic standards of civilized behavior in, econ in economic competition between tra traders or between employees, employers and labor. Um, uh, 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 lying to public authorities in order to gain a competitive advantage, which then causes co loss to the public purse, in our submission would not be um, a, 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 a enforcing basic standards uh, of civilized behavior. Um, para 64, <clears throat> just to pick up, we, we've seen uh, that the um, cases of GWK 
National Phonograph and Lunro have all been expressly referred to, and in paragraph 64 we get Barrett's and Baird, <coughs> um, uh, which again is cited uh, without any suggestion that the test that was being applied is wrong, and as uh, illogics uh, are already aware, although it is a, just a decision at first instance, uh, it expresses the test without any reference to a dealing requirement. Um, if we then just go on towards the right towards the end of Lord Justice uh, of Lord Hoffman's uh, 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 judgment at page um, fifty, <coughs> and it's paragraph one twenty nine, and this is the point exactly that I, I, I made a moment ago, where he aligns the outcome in the Douglas and Hallow case with the licensee cases. <coughs> he says at paragraph one two nine. In view of my conclusion that OK was entitled to sue for breach of an obligation of confidentiality to itself, it's a little artificial to discuss the alternative claim on the footing that the obligation was owed solely to the Douglases. I would have considerable difficulty in reconciling such a hypothetical claim with RCA and Pollard and Isaac Oren and Red Box. Neither Mr Thorpe, entirely unimportant point of social history, but the Rupert Thorpe who was the paparazzo was the son of Jeremy. Um, neither Mr Thorpe nor Hallo did anything to interfere with the liberty of the Douglases to deal with OK or perform their obligations under their contract. All they did was to make OK's contractual rights less profitable than they would otherwise have been. So his, his resolution of the outcome in that case um, it entirely aligns um, the, the, the decision with, with uh, the, 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 um, the points in relation to those licensing cases. Now, the other <coughs> speeches, um, I wasn't going to dwell on Lord Nichols because obviously he's in the minority on this point. Um, the, uh, the other judgments, um, I should say. Uh, it's, House, it's House of Lords, this, Mr. Oh. oh, sorry, no, it is, yes, sorry, yes. Um, uh, uh, so the other speeches um, uh, are <laughs> uh, agree with Lord Hoffman. So um, we certainly look at them. Um, but uh, I'm just wondering in what terms, whether they're explaining so far as anything's cryptic, that uh, as might be argued in Lord Hoffman, but there's any elucidation in terms of the agreement that the um, others express. I, I, I think, uh, well, all I can do is take you to what they do say. Uh, yes. uh, Lady Hale, in terms, says anything I say uh, has to be read as being uh, consistent with Lord Hoffman, and if there appears to be any discrepancy, then Lord Hoffman rules. Um, so, um, uh, let, Lady Hales uh, is, is something about the desirability of single judgments, doesn't she? Well, <laughs> she does also mention that. But um, uh, just going through in, in logical order, first Lord Walker. Um, so, um, uh, so page 74, paragraph 266. <clears throat> On the economic torts, the most important difference is in the identification of the control mechanism. That, that, that's the difference, as you say, between Lord Hoffman and Lord Nichols. The identification of the control mechanism needed in order to stop the notion uh, of unlawful means getting out of hand, for example, a pizza delivery business which obtains more business to the detriment of its competitors because its drivers regularly exceed the speed limit and jump red, red lights. Then he says two things. He says, Lord Hoffman sees the rationale of the unlawful means taught as encapsulated in Lord Lindley's reference in Quinn and Leatham to interference with a person's liberty or right to deal with others, uh, which is not entirely helpful to my case. <coughs> um, in his view, acts against a third party count as unlawful means only if they are or would be, if they caused loss, actionable at the suit of the third party. In terms of ratio, that is the sentence which resolves the difference he describes between the Hoffman and the Nichols um, uh, 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 analyses of what unlawful means uh, constitutes. The rationale one could take or leave, the ratio is what is unlawful means, and you get that from the last sentence, but I have to accept he does talk in terms um, about the liberty uh, or rights to deal with others. Um, just finishing with Lord Walker, um, he also says in 269, uh, <coughs> faced with these alternative views, I'm naturally hesitant. I would respectfully suggest that neither 
is likely to be the last word on this difficult and important area of the law. Um, uh, 269B. The test of instrumentality doesn't fit happily with cases like RCA and Pollard. Since there's no doubt that the bootleggers' acts were the direct cause of the plaintiff's economic loss, the control mechanism must be found, it seems to me, in the nature of the disruption caused as between the third party and the claimant by the defendant's wrong, not in the closeness of the causal connection between the defendant's wrong and the claimant's loss. <coughs> I do not, for my part, see Lord Hoffman's proposed test as a narrow or rigid one. On the contrary, that test, and he does say, set out in para 51 of his opinion, of whether a defendant's wrong interferes with the freedom of a third party to deal with a claimant, if taken out of context, might be regarded as so flexible as to be of limited utility. Pra in practice, it does not lack context. The authorities demonstrate its application in relation to a wide variety of economic relationships and uh, um, favour a fairly cautious incremental approach <coughs> to its can, extension. Can I just ask you a question about 269? Uh, 269. Yeah. When he says the control mechanism must be. So he, he accepts, as I think I was putting to you, that they're all losers in the bootleggers type of case. I mean, yes. Uh, but, uh, the, the licensee is economically a loser. Absolutely. And also, of course, the copyright owner. Yeah. But therefore, if there's to be a limitation, what is the limitation? Yes. And here he says, um, the test of instrumentality does not, there's a general point, I think, where he's uh, opting for Lord Hoffman rather than Lord Nichols. Yeah. And he's saying, Test of instrumentality is not fit happy with cases like RCA Pollard, since there is no doubt, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay, go on. And he says, the control mechanism, this must be a general point, isn't it? the control mechanism must be found, it seems to me, in the nature of the disruption caused, as yeah. between the third party and the claimant, by the defendant's wrong. Now, yeah. what I'm suggesting to you, or putting to you, is that's the point, isn't it? This is a general observation he's making. Uh, not limited to license cases or other cases, but what you've got to find by way of a limitation to restrict the tort is something in the nature of disruption caused as between the third party and the claimant. Yes. I completely agree with that. The only difference between us, and it's, it's incredibly narrow, but it's an incredibly important, the only difference between us and the respondents is whether that control mechanism is captured by 47A of Hoffman, sorry, Lord Hoffman, a wrongful interference with the actions of a third party in which the claimant has an economic interest, or whether it is captured by the second sentence of 51. It does not, to my mind, include acts which may be unlawful against a third party, but which do not affect his freedom to deal with the claimant. Those are narrower words in 51 than in 47. What you just put to me from 269 is entirely consistent with 47A. The nature of the disruption is a disruption which involves a wrongful interference with the actions of a third party in which the claimant has an economic interest. I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that that's not the your, your, your submission is, is the same thing. There we are. I've got the submission. <coughs> you have it. <coughs> um, <coughs> and he, Lord Walker finishes Power 270 uh, with the words, I would favour a fairly cautious incremental approach to its extension to any category not found in the existing authorities. Lundra and Fyde is one of the existing authorities. He would regard anything more than that as an extension. <coughs> Um, but uh, in our submission, there is absolutely nothing that he says uh, that can be read as uh, a, a suggestion that, that Lundra and Fyde is being overruled sub silentio. Um, onwards to page 85. Uh, Baroness Hale. As I say, if you look at in, uh, right towards the bottom of the page at letter H. <coughs> There's a sentence uh, beginning, any perceived inconsistency between what I say and what he says, that's Lord Hoffman, is to be resolved in favour of the latter. So she is overtly not trying to say anything different. Um, <coughs> well, then, um, just uh, uh, to be clear, over the page, page 86, the sidelined paragraph uh, 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 you will be aware of, um, she says she, that's why she has no difficulty on the first two issues. That, that, that includes our, our issue. The underlying rationale 
of both the Lumley and Guy, that's inducing breach of contract, and the unlawful means tort is the same. The defendant is de deliberately striking at his target through a third party, but the means used to strike must be unlawful. They may either be a wrong committed by the third party against the target, <coughs> um, or be a wrong committed by the defendant against the third party. So the former is the inducing breach of contract, the second is causing loss by unlawful means. That the rules governing each are different, in particular the intention is different and the damage procured is different. Nevertheless, the common thread is striking through a third party who might otherwise be doing business with your target, whether by buying goods, hiring his parties, or working for him or whatever. <coughs> As I say, she's expressly not saying anything different from Lord Hoffman, <coughs> Uh, and we would suggest that that is not, that sentence there is not an attempt to define the tort. She is simply using <laughs> descriptive language um, uh, uh, to, to, to refer to the kind of activity that can be caught. Um, and then finally, um, Lord uh, Brown, uh, page um, 91, <coughs> paragraph 320 at the very bottom of the page, uh, and again, he does, um, I, I obviously have to accept, he uses the language at the very bottom of the page, um, where he says, uh, as Lord Hoffman explains, any liability for this tort is primary, uh, and it arises where the defendant generally, to advance his own purposes, intentionally injures the claimant's economic interests by unlawfully interfering with a third party's freedom to deal with him. Now, if you take that to be Lord Brown's definition <coughs> Uh, of, of the tort, uh, then it supports my own friend's um, argument. But uh, our, our response essentially is that what matters is to understand what Lord Hoffman was in fact saying, because the majority was agreeing with him, not seeking to say anything different or narrower. Um, uh, and the, um, the, the, the ratio, again, on the points that, that mattered in the case uh, is in the fourth line. The unlawfulness is that of the defendant towards the third party and the defendant's conduct must be such as would be actionable at the suit of the third party had he suffered loss. The had he suffered loss wording is needed in order to preserve cases like Lunro and Fired because the Secretary of State doesn't suffer any loss. So there is no support for any suggestion that Lunra and Fired was being overruled, and uh, as, as we submit, um, that is not uh, the um, uh, in intended uh, effect <coughs> of the judgment uh, of, of the speeches. Um, my lords, there is then, um, th th that, that, that's, the, that, that's all I wanted to say on um, uh, OBG and Allen. Um, there are a number of cases since then and some commentary since then, which I'm going to take um, very lightly. Um, each side has found um, some comfort in cases decided since, um, but uh, you may not find an enormous amount of assistance from any of them. Um, we uh, have um, offered, we offer to you a decision of the late um, uh, Mr. Charles Pearl QC, who is sitting as a um, Deputy High Court Judge uh, in the case of uh, NHS Luton Clinical Commissioning Group against a pharmacist, and that's, um, I, I'm not going to take you to them, but it's in bundle two of the authorities, tab 13. Um, <clears throat> and it was, it, in, in many senses, had, had close similarities to our case. It was a claim by, basically, the NHS against a fraudulent pharmacist who generated um, false invoices in order to claim reimbursement. Um, uh, but the invoices were delivered to uh, because of the structure of things, to a, a third party for these purposes. And the um, NHS uh, commissioning group uh, was the party that suffered loss. Um, and, and it was said in that case, um, as in this case, uh, that there was, uh, was argued that there was no um, uh, dealing uh, between uh, the NHS uh, and the third party. Um, and uh, Mr. Pearl reviewed um, OBG and Allen, um, thought, uh, commented that, um, on Lord Walker's observation that it wasn't the last word, and refused to strike the claim out. Um, he seems to have been more sympathetic to Lord Nichols 
analysis than Lord Hoffman's, but um, that's a, perhaps a bold position for a deputy judge to take. <coughs> but in any event, um, that is uh, uh, one case that, that uh, we found where, where these matters have been resolved, uh, debated um, since OBG. And my learned friends have come up with a case called Elite Property and Barclays, which is uh, in the um, first authorities bundle at tab four. Uh, again, uh, it doesn't really contain any uh, informative analysis. It simply assumes that paragraph, the second sentence of paragraph 51 of OBG and Allen uh, is part of the ratio, uh, and it proceeds on that basis. Um, one case which, that I did... Which, which, which tab is that? Which sorry, that's called Elite Property, and it's bundle one, tab four. You don't want to take any passages. I, I, no, I'm, the, the, um, the first instance decision. It's the first, another, another first instance. Um, <clears throat> there is a Canadian case, which we just want to take to, not because it's binding on you, but because it's thoughtful and interesting. Um, uh, so I will just very quickly walk you through this one. It's in the first authorities bundle at tab one. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I, I, I do commend um, it to you because, it, 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 it's, as I say, it's a thoughtful analysis of what this tort is all about and why it's there and what it's doing and what its logical parameters are. <coughs> it's a curate's egg, so far as my argument is concerned, because the Canadian court did accept that the second sentence of para 51 is part of the ratio, but they decided that it was, that was unprincipled uh, and was not going to be followed in, in Canada. Um, and um, for very similar reasons, we will be urging you to take a, uh, a view that um, it, 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 it is, in fact, not only unprincipled, but unsupported by previous authority and not necessary for the disposal uh, of the uh, case in OBG and Allen, because uh, that case could and should be regarded as having been decided by reference to para 47A of uh, Lord Hoffman's um, uh, uh, speech. It is a decision of the Supreme Court. Okay. Which, yes. Yeah, which, uh, which tab so we're in tab one of one. <coughs> tab one. <coughs> and very shortly, um, the context was a family owned block of flats. Uh, different family members owned um, uh, uh, shares in it through corporate vehicles. Most of the family wanted to sell the block. There was one dissenter who didn't. Um, as a result of his obstruction, the block didn't get sold for many years, and when it was finally sold, it was sold for much less than it would have been if it had been sold earlier. So the majority of family members sued the dissenting uh, family member, and, uh, 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 certainly his, his corporate, uh, and, and his corporate vehicle, alleging a number of things, including breach of fiduciary duty as a director and, and, and so on, but also including a claim based on um, uh, causing loss by unlawful means. And it's obviously in relation to that uh, that, that um, I just want to <coughs> draw your attention to a couple of passages. So uh, page 186 in the top left-hand corner. Um, uh, in paragraph 4, uh, the court identifies the, um, the, the main issue concerning the scope of liability for this tort in particular what the unlawfulness requirement means. If the tort does not apply to the facts, we must also decide whether liability may be imposed on the basis of breach of fiduciary duty. And then uh, the summary rulings are set out in paragraph 5. A, what is the scope of liability for the tort of causing loss by unlawful means? And he, his, the court's conclusion was in light of the history and rationale of the tort and taking into account whether it fits in the broader scheme of modern tort liability, the tort should be kept within narrow bounds, narrow in the OBG and Allen sense. It will be available in three-party situations in which the defendant commits an unlawful act against a third party, and that act intentionally causes economic harm to the plaintiff. One, what sorts of conduct are considered unlawful? Conduct is unlawful if it would be actionable by the third party, it would have been actionable if the third party had suffered loss as a result. <coughs> um, and then they go on to make findings on the basis um, of that case. We can then move straight on to page 192, um, where you get the heading 3, analysis, what's the scope of liability? <coughs> 
and the sub first subheading what sorts of conduct are considered unlawful, the unlawful means tort creates a type of parasitic liability in a three-party situation. It allows a plaintiff to sue a defendant for economic loss resulting from the defendant's unlawful act against a third party. Liability to the plaintiff is based on parasitic upon the defendant's unlawful act against the third party. While the elements of the tort have been described in a number of ways, its core captures the intentional infliction of economic injury on C, the plaintiff, by A, the defendant's use of unlawful means against B, the third party. Um, and then uh, picking it up at uh, 26, <coughs> the scope over the page, at the bottom, very bottom of the page, the scope of the unlawful means tort depends on the answer to three questions. First, does the unlawful conduct have to be actionable by the person at whom it is immediately directed? In my view, um, the answer is yes. Second, is there a requirement that the unlawful means not be otherwise actionable by the plaintiff? No. Third, should the definition of unlawful means be subject to principal exceptions? And he says no to that. Um, I don't think I have time to read to you, but could I perhaps invite you, if you're not going to give an extemporary judgment, um, invite your lordships to look at um, paragraphs 28, really through to the end of 37. Um, it, it, but I'll just pick up paragraph 37 itself. <clears throat> so bottom page 198. There are several possible rationales for the talk, but they are most var mostly variations on two themes. The first, what I'll call the intentional harm rationale, focuses on the fact that harm has been intentionally inflicted. This rationale supports the creation of new tort liabilities in order to reach clearly excessive and unacceptable intentional conduct. The second, and in my view the preferred rationale, focuses on extending an existing right to sue from the immediate victim of the unlawful act to another party whom the defendant intended to target with the unlawful conduct. I would call this the liability stretching rationale. The focus of the tort on this understanding is not on enlarging the basis of civil liability, but on allowing those intentionally targeted by already actionable wrongs to sue for the resulting harm. Um, and then that, those alternatives are debated. Um, <clears throat> and if we can then just go on to... Uh, his discussion on page 204 of the jurisprudence in other jurisdictions and with a certain symmetry in paragraph 51 he discusses Lord Hoffman's paragraph 51 leading case on unlawful means taught uh, in England is OBG uh, and um, he notes that, that um, uh, the majority preferred the <coughs> requirement that the wrong against the third party should be actionable um, or would be but for um, uh, if they had been lost. Uh, and then about eight lines from the end, he says this, Lord Hoffman added a further requirement to his definition of unlawful means. The unlawful means must interfere with the third party's freedom to deal with the claimant, power 51. The plaintiff must therefore have an economic interest at stake in the interference by the defendant uh, with the third party. <coughs> so he, he does read it uh, as being part of the ratio. But if we then look forward at paragraph um, 214, no, sorry, page 214. We can skip that. Um, sorry, let's go, let's go straight to 219. Page 219, paragraph 87. Where he revisits this point. <clears throat> 87. In Lord Hoffman's reasons in OBG, he added a further requirement to the unlawful means taught, namely that the unlawful means employed must interfere with the third party's freedom to deal with the plaintiff. Uh, C 51 to 54. Lord Hoffman held that without such limitation there is a danger that it will provide a cause of action based on acts which are wrongful only in the irrelevant sense that a third party has a right to complain if he chooses to do so. This additional requirement 
has not been included in the formulation of the tort adopted by Canadian appellate decisions that otherwise approve Lord Hoffman's approach to the unlawful means tort, although the point was not specifically at issue in those cases. And then after citing those, he says this, respectfully, I don't find this additional requirement helpful in outlining the proper bounds of the unlawful means tort. This requirement is not supported either by the authorities or by the rationale for imposing liability. Whether the unlawful means interfere with the plaintiff's right to deal with the injured third party or with some other party, the fact that the defendant aims at the plaintiff provides a sufficient nexus between the unlawful means and the interests of the plaintiff to justify imposing liability. Rather than resort to this additional freedom to deal qualification, I prefer to limit the scope of the unlawful means taught through a narrow approach to both the unlawful means component, as discussed above, and the intention component, as discussed below. Um, so uh, I, I, we felt it may be helpful just, first of all, to put that in front of you, because it, it does, in fairness, treat what Lord Hoffman says in 51 as part of the ratio, but it also provides what we suggest is an interesting and, and uh, we would also suggest persuasive um, a, a, a critique uh, if that is part of the ratio. If you find that critique uh, persuasive, it may encourage you not to treat what is said in para 51 as being part of the ratio in relation to the tort generally, uh, because it is unprincipled and it is unsupported by the authorities that preceded it. Does that mean that he's opting for Lord Nichols' approach? No. Absolutely not. No, he's not. So one gets that. That was paragraph five right at the beginning. The, the control mechanism, and indeed it, 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 it's reflected in that very last comment he made uh, in paragraph 87, where he talks about the control mechanism. <coughs> um, I would prefer the last five lines. I prefer to limit the scope of the unlawful means toward through a narrow approach to both the unlawful means component. That was the Hoffman-Nichols divide, the, the unlawful means component, and he answers it, the summary is on page 186, paragraph 5a, um, the tort is available in three-party situations if the defendant commits an unlawful act against the third party and that act intentionally causes the economic harm to the plaintiff, the conduct is unlawful if it would be actionable by the third party or would have been actionable if the third party had suffered loss as a result. That is Lord Hoffman, without para 51 second sentence. So he's, he's on, on, on the Hoffman side in relation to what is unlawful means, but he, he stops at para 47, so to speak, uh, and doesn't take the second sentence of para 51. Um, the only other case um, uh, uh, that, since OBG and Allen that is worth mentioning is the case of Emerald Supplies against British Airways, which is in the same bundle at tab 5. <coughs> And this was, I mentioned it very briefly this morning, um, it was a case uh, where um, claims were brought against various airlines uh, which had been found uh, to have entered into uh, an unlawful cartel in relation to freight um, and the claimants were shippers of air freight who sought to use cargo services of freight goods for the freight of goods by in virtually all cases, this is reading from the headnote, acquiring those services indirectly through freight forwarders who are contracted directly with a particular airline. So the factual situation is what was important to the outcome of the case. So the airline, the airlines, enter into an unlawful cartel, but their immediate customers are the freight forwarders, not the shippers. The shippers contract with freight forwarders, the freight forwarders contract with the airlines. The shippers are the ones who are suing. And because the airlines could say, well, we didn't know whether the increased prices that were being charged pursuant to the cartel agreement were going to be passed on to the um, uh, freight forwarders or by the freight forwarders to the shippers or by the shippers to their customers. So they had no idea whether any, and if so, where, an economic loss would be suffered. And because of that, the claim failed on the grounds of intention. It couldn't be shown that the cartel members intended to cause economic loss to any particular plaintiff because the loss could have fallen anywhere. It could have been passed on down the line to, to um, and as I say, uh, between um, uh, forwarders, shippers, or um, ultimate customers. 
Uh, and so um, the decision is, um, uh, it, in, in terms of its ratio, it's a decision uh, on, uh, uh, on, on the, the intention element. Um, the, there is quite a lot in it other than that, but the, the relevant part, just so you've got it, the relevant part of the judgment starts at 196. Um, and um, I just do want to pick it up at page 200 to show you what was and what was not said um, in the Court of Appeal. <coughs> Uh, so, paragraph 127, the tort, as defined by Lord Hoffman, involves three parties. There can exceptionally be a two-party two case, um, blah, 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 and then after the, the parentheses, the claimants submit that the three-party tort of interference is committed here in a number of ways. And it's important to keep in mind there are three grounds of alleged un unlawfulness. First, BA was taken on, uh, has taken unlawful action against the freight forwarders, namely infringing EU competition law and the tort of deceit, both of which would be actionable by them if they could show loss, and through the freight forwarders it has caused harm to the shippers. Further, so this is the second ground of alleged unlawfulness, BA has deceived the various national regulators who would, in principle, have a claim in damages if they had su suffered any to accept their pricing arrangements and thereby caused harm to the claimants. So the second ground of alleged unlawfulness was lying, deceiving a public authority. And then the third, in addition, the claimants have alleged that the unlawful means include the breach of various foreign competition laws although whether they confer any right of action on the freight forwarders as their direct purchases as they allow services will, as we said, depend upon how those laws are framed. <clears throat> so, there's unlawfulness in terms of a breach of competition law, unlawfulness alleged in terms of deceiving a public authority, and unlawfulness in terms of a breach of foreign competition law. And then in 128... They say this, apart from the narrow formulation of unlawful means, there are two other limitations on the scope of this tort. First, Lord Hoffman emphasised that in order to constitute relevant unlawful means, the unlawful acts must affect the freedom of the third party to deal with the claimant. Well, that's um, uh, 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 what we're debating. This reflects the rationale as explained by Lord Lindley and Quinn and Leatham. If that freedom remains, the tort is not committed, even though the defendant acts unlawfully and thereby makes a profit. Examples, we've got Pollard again, Isaac Oren, and so on. And then um, <clears throat> they say this in 129. We are very doubtful whether action which simply increases the price at which freight services can be acquired by the claimants can be said to affect the freedom of freight forwarders to deal with the shippers. It may affect the way in which that freedom can be exercised if, say, the shippers chose, uh, choose not to purchase the services because they're too expensive but that does not seem to be an interference with the freedom itself. However, this issue is not directly before us, and we did not hear any detailed argument about it, so it would be wrong to express any concluded view. Accordingly, for the purposes of this appeal, we will assume that the claimants would be able to establish that the means employed by BA, including the breaches of the foreign competition laws, were unlawful for the purposes of these two torts, and that as a consequence, BA interfered with the liberty of the freight forwarders to deal with the claimants. <coughs> If it had been the case that uh, lying to a public authority could never constitute the unlawful act for the purposes of this tort, one would have thought that the Court of Appeal would, in this case, say so, because that would have eliminated the second of the alleged grounds of unlawfulness. So, although it is an, a, a somewhat oblique support for our position. It is the case that what was pleaded in that case was, among other things, unlawfulness by means of a deception of a public authority. And that claim was not struck. The claim was ultimately dismissed um, uh, for reasons of, as I say, for, for, for want of um, ability to prove intention. Um, uh, uh, so um, it, it may be said against you, well, they didn't have to decide that because they decided on other grounds. Fair, fair enough in a sense. 
but if there is such a genuinely obvious point that um, deception of a public authority uh, can never ground this tort because it doesn't involve um, the uh, uh, um, interference, any interference with the third party's um, freedom to deal, then, then, as I say, one would have expected that uh, to form part of the ratio. <coughs> what, what, what do you say then, paragraph 1 to 8 at the beginning, first, that sentence, first Lord Hoffman emphasised, in order to constitute relevant unlawful means, the unlawful acts must affect the freedom of the third party to deal with the claimant. That's, um, Lord, as I say, that, that is a, a, a reflection of the application of section 47A of Lord Hoffman to the cases that are then immediately discussed again in this, as they were immediately after 51 in, in OBG and Allen, RCA and Pollard, and um, Isaac Oren. It is a description of how the 47A requirement applies in relation to a claim based on dealing, or certain categories of dealing, not in relation to a case based on an alleged deception of a public authority. Um, the only other things um, uh, 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 that have happened uh, since that we have found are um, some articles Lord Hoffman, four years after um, uh, OBG and Allen, wrote um, a chapter in a book on um, uh, economic torts, uh, and he called his chapter The Rise and Fall of Economic Torts, and extrajudicially, uh, he did say that um, uh, 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 the speeches in OBG and Allen uh, did restrict uh, the tort to the application um, or, 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 or to, to situations where a third party's freedom to deal has been interfered with. Um, Extrajudicial comments are, are interesting, but... Um, you if can't possibly... I, mean, I, 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 I don't know if have to see what the other side say about this, but uh, it seems to me at the moment the fact that a judge seeks to explain his judgment subsequently in a way which, on your analysis, isn't borne out by the actual... It can't possibly change the meaning of what he said in no, the case. Exactly. So um, I, I merely mention it because uh, it is a criticism of the judgment below against which we are appealing but the, the, the judge did derive assistance from it overtly. Uh, and uh, we submit yeah, I mean, he was. that is the legal equivalent of a jury point. Um, uh, it, insofar as um, I'm not addressing a jury, I won't press it. Um, but um, uh, it, it, it's uh, the, the only other commentary is um, by. Um, a I was sir. About, I'm not talking about your comment, I'm talking about reliance on the... No, no, absolutely. Um, uh, the, um, the, the only other article is um, a, one by um, um, Sir Philip Sales, as he was when he wrote it, um, uh, in which he criticises um, the, uh, the Hoffman approach, uh, and we've included that in the authorities bundle as well. It's in um, tab uh, 20 of the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Sales, as he then was, the first attempt to Exactly. So neither has <coughs> shown any great willingness to change their ground. Um, and the reference to that Lord Hoffman article. So the Lord Hoffman asks, uh, it, it, it's a chapter in the book, in fact, but yeah, so it's, it's bundle two of the authorities, uh, tab 18. And you will see, if, if, if it's not very long, and it's immensely readable because it's, it, it's in the usual vigorous style, um, expressing no uh, particular enthusiasm for any economic torts at all. Um, in fact, he describes them all as having little rational basis in social or economic policy. And it's written as a man who would, in fact, have abolished Lumley and Guy, um, uh, as well as uh, getting rid of uh, causing loss by unlawful means if it had been within his power. So it is, it is as much rhetoric uh, as it is legal analysis. Uh, um, uh, Sir Philip Sale's um, uh, article is in tab 20 of the same volume and is, of course, um, uh, more analytic um, and, uh, and, and, and better for it. <laughs> um, the, uh, the final point that we just wanted to make was this, that, um, uh, uh, and, and you've seen the, the, the uh, um, you've seen that this foreshadowed in, in uh, our reading the uh, opening words of Lord um, Halsbury in uh, Quinn and Leatham. I just wanted finally to say a few words about the doctrine of precedent. Um, the doctrine of precedent obviously operates only by reference to those parts of a binding previous decision which were necessary to the determination of the issues uh, in that case. Uh, and we have included uh, in the bundle <coughs> the case of um, frozen value and heron foods uh, which uh, deals with that. The relevant passages are sidelined. They're not going to surprise you. 
uh, and I don't think there's any particular need uh, to go to them. They quote um, what uh, Lord Halsby says uh, in um, uh, 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 Quinn and Leatham. It's, it's paragraphs, uh, well, they're all sidelined, paragraphs 117. Well, what's the one. reference, Mr. Crimson? So it's, so it's in bundle one of the authorities, tab, seven, uh, tab six. And the relevant paragraphs are 117 to 120. I, I, I wasn't going to read them because I don't think that they're, they're, they're either controversial or, or um, particularly uh, surprising to you. But the reason we wanted to emphasize that um, is uh, that um, the point remains this, that if, as I say, our first line of argument is that the second sentence of paragraph 51 in Avery and Allen does not in fact form part um, uh, 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 of the uh, ratio um, of the case because it is not necessary to the um, uh, decision uh, 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 in relation to the case in hand. It is not necessary um, uh, uh, to the case in hand for the House of Lords to be expressing a view on whether or not a claim in relation to facts which are not before the House, involving a claim based on the deceit of a public authority, could or could not survive. Um, the, if you are against me on what the words on the page mean, uh, and you take the view that on the face of it, Lord Hoffman was saying that an interference with the freedom of the third party to deal with the plaintiff is a necessary part of all tortious claims based on using uh, 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 unlawful means to cause loss. If you think that is what the words say, then our fallback, as I say, is that um, uh, uh, that is simply with the greatest respect to the House of Lords, not something they can do. They are not legislating for cases that were not in front of them. Uh, they are expressing a ratio in relation to the case that was in front of them it was an OBG and Allen, Douglas and Hallow. Uh, uh, they were not public authority cases. Uh, and uh, on the basis, as I say, it really comes back to the very simple proposition that if you look at all the cases leading up to OBG and Allen, this restriction, this dealing restriction, doesn't appear. If you look at Lundro and Fired, you have a House of Lords decision that um, a claim should not be struck out where it is based on deception of a public authority, and you have OBG and Allen not expressly overruling Lundra and Fired. And it is not a decision, OBG and Allen is not a decision dealing with a public authority case. Uh, and as I say, in those circumstances, our, our um, respectful submission is that it, it, even if you're against us as to what the words, or the, 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 the operation of the words in the second sentence of paragraph 51, uh, are intended by those who wrote them uh, to achieve, then they do not form part of a ratio that binds you in relation to the facts of this case. And that's the short last point. I'm very grateful. My Lords, I don't think I'm going to conclude my submissions today, but I hope I'll get a good way through them. Um, my Lords, the claimant's case rest, rests on a series of claims, and that is as follows. The claimants say that Servier applied for and defended a patent that it should not have done. And then according to the claimant, Servier knew or should have known from the outset that the patent was not obvious and not novel. And they therefore say that Servier's submissions to the EPO and the courts were deceitful. They then say that those representations were acted upon by the EPO and the courts um, by granting and upholding the patent and by granting interim relief 
initially in the Apotex proceedings. So that's the initial set of claims. And just for your Lordship's reference, that's at um, uh, the amended particulars of claim at paragraph 64 to 72. I don't think you were taken to those, but that, that's where those initial claims that set up this tort are set out, and that's in tab 8 of the core bundle. Now, the consequence of that series of actions, the claimants say, was that certain manufacturers of generic uh, medicines didn't enter the market as early as they would otherwise have chosen to do. So that's the immediate consequence that is pleaded, and that's pleaded at paragraph 96.3 of the particulars of claim. And it's then that further consequence that the, uh, the claimants rely on in this case for their claim, because the further consequence, they say, is that because the ge generic manufacturers didn't enter the market, the NHS paid too much for its supplies of Servier's product. And that's because they say that if the generics had entered the market, then competition between them and Servier would have driven down the price of Perindopril. And that point set out at paragraphs 96.6 and 96.7 of the particulars of claim. So that's the chain of events that is the foundation for the claimant's economic tort claim. And you'll have seen from the judgment of Mr Justice Roth below that although proceedings against Servier have been brought by the various health authorities, also in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, um, none of those have advanced this particular point, which is why you just have the English claimants before you today on this point. Um, now, you will also have seen that Servier denies the factual premises underlying this part of the English claimant's claims. And there are also many legal flaws in the claim that we've pleaded, um, not least that, as the judge noted at paragraph 20, there's no doctrine of fraud on the patent office in English <coughs> law, or for that matter, <coughs> EU law under the European Patent Convention. And that's no doubt why um, in, in the ju judgment that set off these claims, as your Lordship has noted, the judgment of, um, of Lord Justice Jacobs in the Apotex proceedings, he, he said, and it's a passage that's quoted by Mr Justice Roth in the judgment below, um, it's right to observe that nothing Servier did was unlawful. It's the court's job to see that um, trials such as the present patent get nowhere and, and so on. So he'd said that there was nothing unlawful in this at that stage. Um, but we haven't, uh, as Mr Justice Roth noted, raised the point about um, the, the fraud on the patent office. Uh, fraud, fraud on the patent office. We've limited our strikeout application to the sp specific legal point that you have before you today. And the reason we've done that is we, we say it is a, a, is a discrete point and it's a knockout blow to this part of the claim. Uh, and that's the dealing point. And it's common ground that um, there were no, there was no interference with dealings between. Um, the EPO and the courts on the one hand and the claimants on, on the other. All that, they, all that the EPO and the courts did was to make decisions about the validity and enforceability of the patents. And as I've just described, that then gave rise to the series of consequential events which the claimants say led to them suffering loss. And our submission in short is that um, the claim therefore doesn't meet the test for the tort as set out in OBG and Allen. And as my learned friend said, that um, means that this appeal turns on the very short point, which is what is the ratio of the relevant part of OBG and Allen? Was it, as the judge found, that what is required is an interference with the third party's freedom to deal with the claimant? And our submission, that is clearly correct. Um, and as I will go on to develop um, in our submission, that's obvious from the face of the judgment in OBG, not only the judgment of Lord, Lord uh, the speech of Lord Hoffman, but also the other speeches of the majority. Um, it's also set out unambiguously in the judgment of the Court of Appeal in Emerald. Um, also, for what it's worth, the judgment uh, more recently of the High Court in Elite and Barclays. And as my learned friend has candidly acknowledged, the Canadian Supreme Court also acknowledges that as the ratio. Um, uh, and then we have the academic articles, which, likely, which likewise don't demur from that being the ratio. So, so our submission is that the definition of the tort is, as the judge correctly found, set out in paragraph 51 and the whole of paragraph 51 of OBG. Now, the claimants have put forward, I, I think by now, three variants of their case. Um, the first is that uh, paragraph 51 
is the ratio for non-public authority cases, but there is a different rule for public authority cases. And that was the position that I thought was being advanced in their skeleton argument. But the second variant is that that is the ratio for dealing cases, but not for any other cases. And that is what I thought my learned friend was starting to say this morning. The third variant is, I think, where he came out at in his submissions by the short adjournment, which is um, that paragraph 51 is not the ratio for any case at all, public authority or not, dealing or not, and that the ratio for all cases is as set out only in paragraph 47a, perhaps taken together with the first sentence of paragraph 51 and also paragraph 61. And although I confess myself somewhat confused by these different iterations of the case, um, I will try to address your lordships on all of them. And I think my submissions do in any event cover, cover all of them. And I'll, and I'll make sure that over, overnight, if I haven't addressed some of them, I will make sure that, that I deal with that tomorrow. So uh, the structure of my submissions, um, I would propose this as follows. I, I'd like to start with OBG because we say that is is the start and should be the end of this case. But along the way, I'll make some, some comments about the cases that were cited and relied upon by Lord Hoffman in particular, including Lawn Row. And I also think at that point it would be appropriate to comment on the precedential value and, uh, and how, how one brings in the, um, the comments that were made in the Frozen case. Um, then I'll look at the subsequent cases and, and perhaps touch on the academic articles um, that consider the OBG test for what they're worth. I, I can just let you know what submissions on those are and um, for completeness if I haven't dealt with all of the other cases I'll then sweep up the other earlier cases um, at that point and uh, and then I will address the court um, finally on the policy implications of the claimant submission so that that part of um, my submissions was really dealing with this idea that their public authority cases were in a different category so I so I will overnight um, uh, attempt to, to gather in all of the other variants of, of that as well, because I expect I won't get on to that um, today. So if I then can start with OBG, um, and I think it's worth going to this again, because although um, my learned friend took you to a number of the passages of that, what I, I don't think he did, and that I'm, I mean no res disrespect, but I don't think what he did was to actually explain how the judgment and how the relevant part of the judgment is structured. Because that, by looking at the structure and what's said by Lord Hoffman, uh, that really explains where he sees the different elements fitting in. And in particular, when he refers to particular cases, if one sees where they fit into his different elements of the tort as set out, that explains why some cases are referred to for some particular propositions and don't undermine what he's saying about other propositions. So if we can just start with the, with the head note, just, uh, and I'm sure you've got this already, um, point, point three on the head note, which is at page three, um, extracts what the headnote writer certainly thought of was the was the ratio of the uh, of the decision of the majority on the def definition of the unlawful interference tort, and this ex essentially point three replicates paragraph um, fifty one of Lord H Hoffman's speech, and then over the page um, point seven sets out the majority decision on the application of that principle to the, uh, um, to the, to the relevant appeal, the, uh, the um, OK and Hello case. So that's just the head, head note. Now, if, if we then turn to Lord Hoffman's speech and pick, um, pick that up, I won't go to the early parts. What he does in the early parts of the, of the case is explain how everything was very confused, and that's a point made, I think, by um, my Lord, Lord Justice Longmore. Um, this morning that I think it's common ground that up until this point there was a deal of confusion and he in particular was commenting on the fact that some of the cases tried to set out a unified theory of the tort um, but others had rightly in his view kept the two uh, kept, kept the different torts separate kept the unlawful interference tort separate from Lumley and Guy and, and that um, was the context in which he cited with approval for example Allen and Flood uh, but then said in Quinn and Lethem uh, 
that, that, that in, in those the seeds of confusion were sown and then and, and the confusion then set in properly by GWK and Dunlop. So the early part of his, um, his speech is explaining how things had become confused, but then um, commenting finally at the end in paragraph 38 that this distinction um, between direct and in, uh, indirect interference is unsatisfactory and that the two talks should be separated and saying there that they should be restored to the independence which they had enjoyed at the time of Allen and Flood. And that then sets up the subsequent discussion of the two talks as separate talks. So then if we then pick up paragraph 45, and I think this is really important because paragraph 45 and 46 are um, what Lord Hoffman thinks as the two cases which set out the most important elements of what he goes on to articulate as the tort. So paragraph 45, he extracts a passage from Lord Watson in Allen and Flood, and this passage is talking about illegal means, the actionability requirement. And as my learned friend has absolutely rightly said, the Allen and Flood case was directed at this particular question is it necessary to have unlawful means? Or does malice convert something that was lawful into an unlawful act for these purposes? So that was why he was citing Allen and Flood. This was all about the actionability requirement. And then he cites, par um, at paragraph 56, he cites Quinn and Lethem. And he describes this as the setting out the rationale of the tort. And this is an important passage um, because... In this passage, Lord Lindley was explaining that by framing the tort in the way that he did, solved the remoteness problem that might otherwise arise. And, and that's because the damage to the claimant through interfering with the claimant's de dealings with the third party is, in this kind of case, an interference with somebody's liberty to deal with another. It's not simply an indirect consequence of the wrong to the third party. Rather, the damage to the claimant is the very object of the defendant's wrongful act because the defendant is striking at the bond between the two parties, the bond between the third party and the claimant by striking at the liberty of the two parties to deal with each other. So he's saying in this passage, and Lord Lindley is saying in this passage, which Lord Hoffman cites with approval, in this case, the damage is not remote or unforeseen, but is the direct consequence of what has been done. And that's an important passage because that then sets up and gives meaning to what he then goes on to say in the next paragraphs. So we then get paragraph 47, where Lord Hoffman sets out at a very high level, what he describes as the essence of the tort. Um, a, a wrongful interference with the actions of the third party in which the claimant has an economic interest. And B, an intention to cause loss to the claimant. Now, the claimants identify this passage, 47, as setting out the ratio of the case. And in our submission, it's not, or at least it's not the whole of the ratio, it's a summary, a high-level summary, of what he then goes on to develop, because Lord Hoffman then goes on to explain exactly what he means by the two requirements that he set out in A and B. So looking at A in abstract um, doesn't tell you anything, because that's what he then goes on to explain in the following passages of his judgment. And what you see in the following passages of his judgment is that he separates A into two distinct sub-elements. The first is the requirement for the act done to the third party to be unlawful in itself, which is the actionability requirement, which is the point that he's got from Allen and Flood. And the second, though the second half of A, is a requirement for there to be an interference in the sense of an interference with the third party's freedom to deal with the claimant. So if you like, paragraphs 45 and 46, Allen and Flood and Quinn and Lethem, map onto the two sub-elements of what Lord Hoffman thinks of are, as, as comprised in um, A, for paragraph 47A. So what you actually get out of this is three elements, which are the, the three that are then set out in paragraph 51. There are three requirements. One actionability, two, the interference with the freedom of dealing, and number three is intention. And that is very apparent from the following passage of his 
um, speech because he goes through each, each one of those three requirements in turn. So he starts off with the first of those three, which is the actionability requirement. And that's dealt with at paragraphs 48 to 50. Now, that, there, there are a couple of things to say about that, um, those, pas th those paragraphs. First, just to note in passing, at the end of 48, he makes the comment that in principle the case is established that intentionally causing someone loss by interfering with the liberty of action of a third party in breach of a contract with him is unlawful. Now, he, he is at paragraph 48 um, in the actionability section, or the what is the wrongful act section of his, of his speech. But he's obviously foreshadowing there what he then goes on to say about the, the second element, the nature of the interference. So he then goes on to develop the actionability point at paragraph 49. And he says, subject to one qualification, acts against the third party count as unlawful means only if they're actionable by that third party, the qualification is, and so on. And you've seen that passage. And it's in that context he's, where he's talking about actionability that he cites National Phonograph and Lonro. And you see that Lonro in particular, it follows on from what he said about National Phonograph. And he is talking about the actionability requirement. If you, if you see what he says about Lord, um, National Phonograph, he, he cites a case and says the fraud was unlawful means because it would have been actionable if the third party had suffered any loss. And then he says about Lonro and Fired, Lonro is arguably within the same principle as the National Phonograph case, the principle that he's just set out, which is a principle about actionability. And then he carries on, and at the end of the paragraph 50, he says, um, the allegations were of fraudulent representations made to third parties, which would have been actionable by them if they'd suffered loss. So I will come back and make some more submissions about Lonro, but while we're looking at the structure, this shows you that the citation of National Phonograph and Lonro is a citation because he's using those cases to illustrate the actionability requirements, because in those cases, that was what was discussed. And as I'll show you a bit later, the dealing requirement was not discussed in, in Lonro, and that's why he didn't cite it for that proposition. And that's why there is no conflict between Lonro and the dealing requirement to, that he then goes on to set out in paragraph 51. He's using those cases to illustrate his analysis of actionability which, as we've, um, as we've seen, is, was not unanimous across their lordships because Lord Nichols adopted a slightly different approach. Uh, Mr Crow makes the point that you have got to say that uh, Lonro and Fyde has been impliedly overruled. I don't have to say that. And I'm, I'm, going, to I'm going to address Lord Lonro specifically later, but I thought while we're looking at the structure of, of what Lord Hoffman says, the, the first and foremost point, which leads, which leads to my submission later, that, that there is no inconsistency, is that he's clearly citing Lonro for a specific point and one specific point only at, in this part of his speech, and that is a discussion of actionability. He hasn't got on to the dealing requirement at all by this point. And that's because his speech follows exactly the scheme that he set out at paragraphs 45 and 46 in setting up the tort, and then at 47 when he goes through the different elements, and he's now, now developing each of those in turn. And this is 40, 48 to, 40, to 50 is the actionability requirement. Then at 51... Let's go back to my notes. Okay, this one. Uh, you said that um, you started this line of submission by saying that Lord Hoffman uh, separates out A into two elements. Yes. The second was interference between the claimant. The, the first was the actionability, or what is the, what what kind of wrongful act is required? Does it have to be an unlawful one? And the reason I say that is that paragraphs four, that the first section of his subsequent analysis deals only with that question. It doesn't deal with the, the nature of the interference. He then gets on to the nature of the interference at paragraph 51. 51 does two things. One is that it comprehensively sets out all of the elements of the tort. So you can see here in paragraph 51, you've got all three distinct elements. Um, the actionability requirement... Um, in a way which is unlawful as against that third party. 
you've got the nature of the interference, and that's in both the first and the second, para, um, second sentences. And then you've got the intention. So in 51, you can see all three elements. That's one thing that 51 does. But more importantly, 51 is the start of his discussion about the interference, then, which is my number two. Or if you like, um, the second sub part of 47A. And paragraphs 51 down to, um, down to 55 are all about the, the nature of the interference, so the dealing requirement. And this is where, in our submission, Lord Hoffman... Paragraph to where? This paragraph. 51 down to 55. That's all dealing with... That's all dealing with dealing. It's, it's, it's the, my, my second, my, my number two, or if you put it in the nomenclature in 47, it's the second sub, sub, second sub point in 47A. And what he's doing there in paragraphs 51 to 55 is unpacking what he's said in 47A about the interference with the actions of a third party in which a claimant has an economic interest. He's explaining what kind of interference is required. And you can see from these, from, from these paragraphs that he is categorically not saying that any interference or any economic interest will do. He is absolutely not saying that the, the ratio and the test is as it set out in the summary in 47A. He is developing that and saying, what, what I mean in 47A by an interference is this kind of interference. And this kind of interference is an interference with the third party's dealings with the claimant. And he says that absolutely categorically. There's no suggestion that he's, he's envisaging several different categories of case, maybe one for public authorities and another for uh, other cases. He's not talking about um, one rule for dealing cases and another for other cases. He's, he's setting this out as a, um, a categorical and an absolute proposition. And he explains then at paragraphs 52... Um, onwards, why this explains the results of Pollard and Red Box and another Lawn Row case, Lawn Row and Shell. And what he says is that in those cases, the tort was not made out because they were not cases where there was an interference between the dealings between the third party who'd been wronged by the defendant and the claimants. And he says that explicitly. So, for example, at the end of paragraph 53, the wrongful act did not interfere with the estate's liberty of action in relation to the plaintiff. Paragraph 54, the defendant was doing nothing which affected the relations between the owner and the licensee. Over the page at 55. Oh, wait, 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 54. Uh, so 54 towards the end. Um, uh, near Between F and G. Just after he said, Jacob J rejected the, rejected the claim, the defendant was not doing nothing which affected the relations between the owner and licensee. And then he, he quotes um, uh, Mr Justice Jacob at the, end, um, at the end of that paragraph, but the contractual relations and their performance remain completely unaffected. And he makes the same point in relation to Lawn Rome Shell over the page. He said, Shell did not interfere with any third party's dealings with Lawn Rome. And even if it had done so, its acts were not wrongful in the sense of being actionable. So he's saying neither the actionability requirement was satisfied nor the, nor the dealing requirement. So he, he articulates all three of those cases as turning on what he has described as the ratio of the case. And they were all about an absence of interference with freedom of action in, in dealings between the third party and the claimant. And my learned friend says, well, he could have decided those cases on the basis of the principle set out in 47A. He could have simply uh, picked up the wording in 47A and said they were, all, um, they, they were all cases where the tort wasn't made out because that requirement wasn't satisfied. But that's not what he did. He didn't use the language of 47A. In all three cases, he used the language of um, the second sentence of um, paragraph 51. 
So he's, he set out his ratio, he's then applied it to a series of, of previous cases. And he then, um, in an important section of his judgment at paragraphs 56 to 61, explains why he's confining the tort in this way. In other words, 56 to 50, 61 explain why the, these dual requirements of actionability and interference with dealings are important limitations on the tort. And the first reason he gives is to refer back to the origins and rationale of the tort. And so then he goes back to Allen and Flood and Quinn and Lethem. Allen and Flood, the actionability requirement, Quinn and Lethem, the interference with liberty of action. So he says this is where the historical origins of the tort lie. And this is what those cases were, 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 were trying to do. They were, this talk was designed only to enforce ba basic standards of civilised behaviour and economic competition between traders or between employers and labour. So they were about dealing cases, whether it was dealing between two traders or dealing between a company and its employees. And he is, he is saying this was all about interfering with those kinds of relationships and it, the tort should not be extended beyond that. And then the other reason he gives at paragraph 58 is the remoteness point. And the point is that if the wrongful well, I'm act... Sure, I'm not sure about the point you just made. It's the point you just made. Um, it's not remote. If it's a matter of enforcing basic standards of civilised behaviour in the competition between traders, well, that's what I think the appellant would say is here. I mean, here you've got the, uh, on the one hand, you've got uh, the, uh, the people who would suffer, well, in this case it would be the, uh, the, the, the manufacturer of a, generic, of, of, of a generic drug, and you've got somebody else who's a... Um, uh, who's uh, got the patent. Yes, but the reason why he uses that terminology is that he, the, the old cases that he's referred to, in which he's saying give rise to this kind of case, are cases where one trader strikes at another by, for example, trying to persuade the, the, the employees not to work for another. He's talking about this kind of context, where, where you have a trading relationship, and whether it's an employment relationship or another trading relationship, trying to, for example, trying to seduce a customer by firing candles at them, which was, the, which was one of the earlier cases, which I'm, which I'm going to come to, actually. Um, so he, so he's, I still haven't, sorry, I still haven't followed that answer. Um, here, the effect of gaining a march against the regulatory authorities or the courts in this country was to give the uh, owner of the patent uh, was to give the owner of the patent an unlawful march against competitors and the people who suffered amongst others was the NHS yes I don't understand why you say that's just not like the other case that is a case where there's a comp where there is uh, the, the effect of the wrongful conduct which you must assume in this case, the wrongful conduct of one trader in relation to a third party has caused anti-competitive conduct, causing loss. Well, there, there's two reasons why that was not the kind of thing that he was envisaging and why I said he was envisaging um, the quite narrow situation where a trader strikes at another through interference with dealings. Two answers. The first is that he's, he's explained... Um, at, for example, paragraph 47, I was going to go back to this later, but we can do it now. He's explained the essence of the old cases when he says the old cases of interference with potential customers by threats of unlawful acts clearly fell within, within this description. So he's been talking about, up until that point, um, threats against customers and threats against um, uh, employees. So recent cases in which the tortures have been discussed have also concerned wrongful threats or, or actions against employers with the intention of causing loss to an employee or another employer. So he's talking about union action. And the reason why he, said, why he talks about um, competition between traders is because he's talking about claims by one trader against another in relation to this kind of conduct. He's not talking about knock-on consequential effects for others, which is essentially what the, what the claimants are claiming in this case. 
and I said that there were two there were two 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 answers to your point. So first of all, the cases that he has described and that he has fed into his definition of the tort are those kinds of cases. And the second is that he then goes on to make a remoteness point, and he makes that at paragraph fifty-eight, where he says it's not su sufficient to say there must be a causal connection between the the wrongful nature of the conduct and the loss that's been caused. If a trader secures a competitive advantage over another by marketing a product which infringes someone else's patent, there's a causal relationship between the wrongful loss and the loss which the rival has suffered, but there is surely no doubt that such conduct is actionable only by the patentee. So he makes a remoteness point to explain why he's limiting the tort in the way that he does. And he then develops that particular point in the following passages where he, where he addresses the, the first of the, the sales articles. And he addresses the, the theory that one can deal with this all by a narrow concept of intention. And he rejects that. And he says that rather than referring to a, a narrow concept of intention, which he says places too much of a strain on the concept of intention, he says that at paragraph 60, rather than keeping the tort under bounds by looking at, at intention, his definition, his, his dual definition of actionability and interference with, with dealing is what he thinks is the appropriate limitation on the scope of the, of the, of the tort. And that's why he then summarises the point in the way he does at paragraph 61 in defining the tort of causing loss by un unlawful means as a tort which requires interference with the actions of a third party in relation to the plaintiff. Because he's just said that he doesn't accept the idea of intention as being the appropriate limiting factor. And so he, he's, it's a kind of recap of what he's just said. And he's saying at paragraph 61, well, of course, I'm not saying now anything about um, a two-party situation. And so when my learned friend says, well, 61 sets out the ratio of the tort, um, it doesn't. It's simply a very, again, it's like 47. It's a, it's a summary of something that he has set out comprehensively in the previous paragraphs. And 61 can't be the ratio because apart from anything, it doesn't, doesn't mention, even mention the actionability requirement, let alone the intention requirement in that, in that um, second sentence of 61. Doesn't mention either actionability or intention. He's he's simply saying at a very high level, by define by defining the tort in this way, and mentions one of the ways in which he's narrowed the tort. I'm not saying anything about um, two party situations. And so so sixty one isn't the ratio. Sixty one is a is a um, in passing summary of. The ratio which he has set out far more fully in the previous passage and in particular the one one passage which sets out all three elements of the tort is paragraph 51. So so up until now Lord Hoffman's been dealing with what I have called the first two elements of the tort actionability and in the nature of the interference that's required and then he says, 62, finally, there's the question of intention. So at that point, he turns to the third of the requirements and deals with what he thinks should be the relevant intention. And I don't need to deal with that because that's not an issue um, here. But just to note that when he um, mentions Barrett's and Baird at paragraph 64, he's mentioning it in an, in an intention context because that was a case in, in which the intention was the issue. But in any event, that plainly was a dealing case because it was about workers and their employees, or not work, not exactly employees, it was about the fact stock officers who worked at the abattoirs and without which the abattoirs couldn't function. And, and so it was a, a, about the relationship between those and the abattoirs because by persuading the fact stock officers not to go to work, um, the abattoirs then couldn't, um, couldn't, do, couldn't trade. Um, and and that, was, that was what was being struck at. The, the work that the fat stock officers did at the abattoirs, albeit that they weren't the employees, strictly speaking, of the abattoirs, they were employees of the, um, some, uh, of the, of the regulatory authorities. But you would accept, would you, that uh, um, Mr Justice Henry's definition of the tort uh, does not contain 
which uh, the Lord Hoffman, according to you, now says is an essential element. Well, I am going to come to, to Barrett's and Baird, but, but it's quite clear from, from the judgment in that case that it was a dealing case. I mean, it, it, it was talking about dealings. I, I absolutely accept that one can go to some of these older cases and find bits in the judgments that don't set out the ratio. And that's the ratio as we describe it now and as Lord Hoffman described it. And that's for the reason I gave at the start, which is that at that stage, there were various different cases which addressed different elements of the tort. And Lord, Lord Hoffman, in his speech in this judgment, is bringing them all together and putting some crystallisation on the elements of the tort. So, of course, there will be passages, in, including in Allen and Flood, that say one thing and, and other passages that say something else. And I will go to go to some of the other passages of those cases, but it's, it, but if the Before proposition you, is... That's not really necessary. It's not really necessary, no. Just that's speaking not, from OBG, OBG which, now, yes. Which is a sentence law on yes. a firm and possibly new course. Well, I, I, as I will, I, I think I'll come to in a minute, um, I don't think it's entirely new because Lord Hoffman thought, certainly, that what he was doing was not new, but rather he is extracting the relevant bits of the previous cases, which he said all pointed in this direction. So he, but it doesn't matter really. No. The main point is that that is now that the is, law. That is now the law, yes. yes. So my submission is not new, but anyway, that doesn't matter. And so really what's said in the previous cases doesn't really matter. But for what it's worth, since, since your lordship is asking me about it right now, Barrett's and Baird was a dealing case. Uh, and and that, that case, the reason why there was no detailed discussion of the dealing requirement, A, this all preceded OBG and Allen anyway, but B, it didn't need to be discussed there because that wasn't the focus of the, of the argument. The focus of the argument was on intention. And that was what he cited Barrett's and Baird for. Now, before looking at what the other ju judges um, said in, in OBG, I just want to address um, a couple of points that are, that are made about um, Lord Hoffman's reasoning and how that's to be interpreted. Um, the first is the relevance of Lonro, and, and that's an important point. And they say, because Lonro was referred to in his judgment, <coughs> he must have intended for his statement of principle at 51 to encompass Lonro and to assume that Lonro would have passed on that. Now, I, I foreshadowed what I was <coughs> going to say already, but this is the, the more developed answer. Um, the first response to that is that there is no support um, in any of Lord Hoffman's speech for the suggestion, if it is now advanced by the claimants, that there are different categories of cases because <coughs> of the, the mention of Lonro. And nothing in either the, the, the discussion of Lonro or the subsequent discussion about the nature of the interference or, in, for that matter, the, um, the analysis in Hello um, talks about um, two different categories. And on the contrary, what Lord Hoffman was, was doing was to set out an absolute test. The second... Sorry, what do you mean by an absolute test? It applied to all cases. He wasn't, he wasn't envisaging that there... Paragraph 51. Paragraph 51. Completely applies to all cases. Completely applies to all cases. There's no suggestion. And I said, if this is still the case that's being advanced, that's the, the first two variants of the claimant's case, that there are two categories of case, either public authority in other cases or dealing cases in other cases, in, uh, uh, in which there are two different rules. If that is still being advanced on the basis of Lonro, there's nothing in the discussion in this part of the, the speech of Lord Hoffman that supports that, that suggestion. Um, the second point is that given that Lord Hoffman explicitly set out the facts of Lonro and was well aware that the third party in that case was the MMC, if he had intended that his test should be either carving out or leaving open the possibility of a different rule for a case like Lonro, it's inconceivable that he wouldn't have said so. So if he had meant to say, um, Lonro is absolutely consistent with this particular part of my, um, of my test, because actually the test is broader than I, I'm, I'm saying in 51, you would have expected to see that somewhere in the discussion of the nature of the interference. How do you say he fits Lonro into paragraph 51? No, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm saying he, he doesn't try to. He has to. Well, the point... Otherwise, it, it's, the reasoning doesn't work, does it? No, because there's, there's not an inconsistency, because actually, and this is the point that I was, um, I was going to come on to, um, he is only citing Lonro for the actionability point. Um, and, and the reason is that in that case, that was all that was, that was, all that was being decided. 
Um, and, and I'll and I'm making a few high-level points now, and we'll go to, to Lonro. All right, well, um, we'll come to Lonro in due course. Yes, too. yes, but he, he, was, he, was only, he was only citing Lonro for the actionability point, and that was the only point that he was making about the case, and there's nothing in those comments to suggest that he was making any further points about the nature of the interference. I'd be anxious to see in the end how you say that the survival of the long road cause of action fits in with paragraph 51, yes. 100%. Well, 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 I can, I can come in to that. Course, but well, I mean, well, I can come to that now. Well, the point is that long road was not, um, because that was a strikeout case, um, and the decision of the Court of Appeal not to strike out that um, the claim was focused on the intention and the actionability requirements, as we've seen. And maybe we should just pick up long row, um, which is... Uh, um, Nine and ten and yes, volume so it's one. Yes, that's right. Okay, so we have nine in the first bundle. Now, if you pick up um, the if you pick up the report at, in the judgment of Lord Justice Dillon. So if we go through the different the, the different issues that he is discussing, um, starting at the bottom of page 488, G, um, that passage is talking about intention. So which passage? Um, at the 488G, G. it is submitted to us that even with this tort, it must, as with the tort of conspiracy, have been the predominant purpose. So that passage is talking about intention. Then he says it's also, also submitted for the defendants that for, for this tort of wrongful interference, there must have been a complete tort as between the alleged wrongdoer and the third party. That's talking about actionability. So wait, wait, wait. Over the, the next page, it's 489B. Then if you go down to D, the next point that he makes, it also has to be proved by plaintiff that the un unlawful act was in some sense directed against the plaintiff. So that's going back to an intention. Then there are some comments on the fact that this is a, a strikeout case and the limits of the case have to be refined. And then over the page, 490, he deals with um, um, what my learned friend, I think, correctly describes as the causation issues. Which are which are the other the, the other issue that was raised? And then, if you look at then um, the the next um, judgment, um, Lord Justice Ralph Gibson, he starts at at, at the bottom um, paragraph eight. Um, he he discusses the intention requirement. Gibson. Um, Ralph Gibson, yeah, I'm um, sorry, at the, at the bottom of the page, page 491 at H, that starts off by talking about intention. The next paragraph, starting just above C, is talking about actionability. Quite Must be demonstrably page actionable. 492. 492, just above C. This is a paragraph upon which Mr Crow focused very closely, and uh, yes. I'd certainly like to hear your... Well, he's he's that. talking about the actionability requirement. That that and and it's and, and it's that's clear from the um, from the first sentence. It's also contended that the unlawful means because the two issues that all of that, that all of the judges focused on, which must have been the ones that were argued in that case, were intention and actionability. I am I'm going to come on to um, what was said. The little that was said or trailed regarding what Lord Hoffman defined as the, the interference with dealings requirement. Where, where do you get any sense of the requirement of dealing for yes. the, the interference with dealing by like deceitful statements to the Secretary of State? Well, the, the problem is that that was obviously something that was either not picked up on in terms at all in the way that Lord Hoffman described it, or it was not vigorously argued. I'll show you in a minute where what was said, um, the, and the only the only places in which it was trailed. And I can do that now. Actually, there are two places in which this the dealing requirement was trailed as a requirement um, that fed into the strikeout. 
Um, the first is it possibly in relation to the respondent's notice, where it's described at paragraph at page four eight one, um, paragraph F, and number one that the plaintiff's opportunity to bid was not interfered with by any act of the defendants, but by the Secretary of State's requirement. It's that it's possible that that might have um, uh, might have referred to you know, might have been developed. like a point on causation. Doesn't yeah, it? it does sound like a point on causation, but that that's the respondent's notice. Now, in 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 the recitation of what was argued at, par at page four eight five b, there is a single comment at the end of four eight five b in the in the description of the argument of um, uh, Mr. Graben and Mr. Bratzer right at the end, had no effect on the relationship between the Secretary of State and the plaintiff. That's the only record that, as far as I've been able to find, of any argument that even comes close to this. None of, neither Lord Justice Dillon nor Lord Justice Ralph Gibson deal with this point. The, ni neither of, ni neither of um, Lord Justice Dillon nor Ralph um, Lord Justice Ralph Gibson deal with the point, but Lord Justice Wolf does. So he's the only one that even touches on this. And he um, he says at page 493, this is all very uncertain. Um, I, I agree that the appeal should be allowed, but I have two reservations. Uh, my first reservation is as to whether the fraudulent misrepresentations relied upon by Lonro are sufficiently direct to be capable of amounting to an interference with the plaintiff's business, which is needed for the purposes of the tort. So he's the one judge out of the three in the Court of Appeal that deals with this point. And then he says, I say this for two reasons. Um, one, the fraud relied on consisted of alleged rep misrepresentations as to the qualities of the fires and not as to the shortcomings of Lonro. And two, it is not suggested that the misrepresentations caused the Secretary of State to take any action or to desist from any action against Lonro. Instead, it is alleged that the Secretary of State was influenced not to take action against the fireds. So out of the three judges, the only one who deals with this, and we don't know how, how vigorously it was pursued in argument, but the only one who deals with it expressly raises a reservation as to whether this would have been satisfied. But ultimately, it's not struck out because of the discussion of the other, uh, other issues, mainly intention and actionability, and a feeling that the tort had not by then been fully defined. So that's why I say there is not um, any inconsistency between, between Lonro um, and what Lord Hoffman was saying, because Lonro was a case where this point wasn't, it wasn't decided by the Court of Appeal. Yes, and of, and, of, and of course, Lonro wasn't a, fine, a, fine, a final finding on anything. It was, it was a, a point as to what was arguable at that point of time, when, when, as all of the three judges said, the tort was still in the process of definition. So the nature of the interference, as I said, it was either not argued at all or it wasn't vigorously pursued, there is no there is no indication apart from that one sentence I took you to in the in the description of the arguments um, that this was a point that was taken by the advocates there. It wasn't developed at all by two of the judges and the third judge, Lord Justice Wolf, who did deal with it, would deal with it in a way that's supportive of our case by saying he had reservations about whether this could amount to an interference with their business. Given that, and given the paucity, um, really, that the in terms of the judgments. It is only Lord Justice Wolf. It's not surprising that when Lord Hoffman came to discuss the case, he focused on one of the two issues that Lonro actually did discuss, which was the actionability requirement, um, and didn't, uh, didn't attempt to suggest that this was within what he was saying in paragraph 51, because that point hadn't been decided in, in Lonro. And that's that's my answer to um, to my lord your question as to how I square that with fifty one. I, no, I understand. Thank you. Yes. Now before I uh, yes I was I was then going to just talk about the basis 
for what Lord Hoffman was um, saying about the interference with, with dealing and the, the previous cases. And then I'll then go on to look at how he applied that to hello and then address the court on the other on the other speeches. Now, the other um, the, the basis point is 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 this, and, the, and my learned friends getting back to are we getting back to OBG. OBG, yes. So I so this is all this is all about the discussion of OBG and what Lord Hoffman meant. We have a, a digression to Lonro to explain why Lonro doesn't undermine paragraph fifty one of OBG. Um, and the other general point that's made by my learned friends about what Lord Hoffman was saying is, well, it, um, if, if Lord Hoffman had introduced the requirement um, that appears on the face of paragraph 51, then it wouldn't have had any basis in any of the cases that he discussed. And we d debated this at, uh, um, before, and I said, well, the, the short answer was it doesn't make any difference. But there is a longer answer, which is that um, you can see what, from what Lord Hoffman is saying that he certainly thought that it was very firmly grounded in the precedent cases. Um, and just to make that point good, I can then start at paragraph 6. And just pick up through his, through his historical excursion... Um, what he says about all of these old cases. So paragraph six um, and seven starts out talking about these, the old cases of Garrett and Taylor and Tarleton and McGauley, which were cases of driving away customers, either with threats or with cannons. Um, <laughs> colourful facts of the, the Tarleton and McGauley case. Um, and his comment on those cases was that the defendant's liability was for intentionally causing the plaintiff loss by unlawfully interfering with the liberty of the others. So right at the start of his historical analysis, he's drawing out from these cases that he, they either were or he thinks that they were about interference with the liberty of others. Um, I'm on para pa pa paragraph six and no, seven. Oh, the last sentence. Passages yes. Oh, yes, the last sentence of six. But also, um, so the last sentence of six, intentionally causing the plaintiff loss by unlawfully interfering with the liberty of others. And then he says in paragraph seven, he talks, he talks about um, Brooks and Barnard, and then says an interference with the liberty of others by unlawful means does not require threats. So right from the outset, he's setting up these cases as being about interfering with the um, liberty of others. Quinn and Leatham, which he gets to at paragraph, uh, paragraph 15. Now, we've seen that he extracts from this one of the primary basis of his talk a bit later on, but when he introduces this case, um, Quinn and Leatham was another case about inducing customers or employees to break their contracts with the claimant or not to deal with him. Now, as I've said, his objection to Quinn and Leatham was that he thought that this was sowing the seeds of confusion um, by conflating the two torts, the, un the, the tort of inducing breach of contract with the unlawful means tort. Um, tort. Very common. So, paragraph 15. And he, he's, he's explained, this is, this is the, his historical background to the case and to the different torts. And so he's going through them. But what we know is that he thinks that Quinn and Leatham is a case about, um, is a case where the rationale is set out as being about restricting liberty or right to deal with others. And he said that Where's at he paragraph, that? He, he says that at paragraph 46. But it's a bit confusing because what he does is to go through all these old cases and then draw them together in the, in the section 45. But I'm, what I'm seeking to show you is that when he's going through the cases, he's setting out cases which he understands as being about um, liberty to deal with others. So Quinn and Leatham, he describes at paragraph 15 and onwards, at paragraph 22, when he describes the GWK and Dunlop rubber, rubber case. And the claimants say that this is the case where, um, this was the tyre switching case, and they describe this as being one which fits in with what they articulate as the ration, ratio of OBG at paragraph 47. But if you look at what he says about Dunlop and rubber, he doesn't see this in that, in that way. Uh, at the top of page 25, between A and B, 
he says it has nevertheless interfered with the freedom of the ARM company to fit its vehicles with tyres in accordance with its agreement with GWK. So yet again, he's describing this historical case as one that fits in to what he articulates as the ratio of the tort. Just as an aside, and this is a really pedantic point, but I, we think that in, in that um, sentence between A and B, where, where Lord Hoffman talks about interfering with the freedom, um, I think A, R, M and G, W, K should be the other way around. But that doesn't oh, in sorry. any way... Hang on, I haven't quite got there. So we're, we're now on page 25. 25, yes. Yeah, where sorry, he just, where he, okay. 25 between A and B. It had nevertheless interfered with the freedom of the ARM company. Yes. So he's describing this as an interference with freedom case. Yes, I've got that. And I'm just ma making the pedantic point that we think that he's got ARM and GWK the wrong way round. It was in, should we think it should have been, and uh, we think it's just a typographical error, interference with the freedom of GWK to fit its vehicles with tyres in accordance with its agreement with a um, a ARM, which was the tyre supplier. The ARM had the agreement with the uh, with GWK. GWK was the car. But that's an entirely um, pedantic point. It doesn't change the sentence of the proposition. What I'm showing you is in each and every one of the cases which he then says set up this tort, he is referring to them as being about interference with freedom to deal. So that's what, what, it, what, it, uh, what it turned on. It turned expressly on an interference with the freedom of the third party's dealings with the claimant in the sense that the contract that they should have been free to perform was not being performed because the defendants physically prevented it from being performed by sneaking in and changing the tyres. The next case that he refers to is the Thompson and Deacon case. Um, for your Lordship's note, that's not in the bundles. He deals with that at paragraphs 26, um, 27, 28, and 29. Um, this was another case about union action, which, and in, which in that case prevented the third party company from delivering materials to the claimant. And that, that like Alan, um, well, like, like sorry, um, GWK and Quinn and Leatham, he says that this was a case where the analysis in the original judgment confused the different torts. And he describes it, paragraph 21, how he thinks he would have analysed it. At paragraph 29, he, he says, today one can see that an alternative analysis was available. It would be primary liability for intentionally causing loss by unlawfully interfering with the liberty of a third party under the principle derived from Garrett and Taylor and Tarleton and McGauley, which were the threats and the canons cases. So, he's, so this is yet another case which he says should have turned on an interference with the liberty of action of the third party in relation to the claimant. And then as we've already seen, he, he then returns to the theme um, in a more developed way um, in the section where he sets out the elements of the tort. So that was the, the long answer to the question about what, what you get from the old cases. Short answer is it doesn't matter because he's now um, crystallised what the elements of the tort are. But the long answer is Lord Hoffman at least explained all of those cases as turning or as cases which should have turned, he thought, on uh, an interference with the liberty of the third party to deal with the claimant. So far from being an arbitrary additional requirement which came out of nowhere, Lord Hoffman's view was that the interference with the trading relationship between the claimant and the third party was precisely the reason that animated the previous unlawful means cases. And as he then cited Lord Lindley um, as saying in, in, in um, Quinn Lethem, it's the link that resolves the issue of the remoteness. And so in his analysis, the dealing requirement was squarely rooted in precedent. 
And as I've shown you, there was in the section of the judgment where he said, and that was the right way to do it, paragraph 56 onwards, because the other way of restricting the tort through a narrow concept of intention, he thought, didn't work. So there were two, there, two, two, two bases for what he said. One, this is what the old cases were doing. And secondly, this is the right way of resolving the remoteness problem. You can't get to the same result easily by placing all of the weight on intention because he says that places too great a strain on the concept of intention. So he had a precedential basis for what he was doing and a policy basis for doing that. Uh, and that is why Mr Justice Roth said at um, paragraph 43 that this test is not a mere infelicity of drafting prompted by um, the factual context of the case, but the concept of an interference with the third party's dealings was core to the reasoning of the majority. And I uh, will now come on to, see, uh, to show you what the majority said, because they rooted it in the same cases, especially Quinn and Leatham, and in the same kind of precedent and policy considerations. Um, before we get to what the majority said, the last bit, uh, point I need to pick up on in Lord Hoffman's analysis, then, is how he analysed the, um, the Hello case. And you've, you've already seen that, so uh, that's at paragraph 129. The only point to make is that he is very squarely um, analysing the hello case on the basis of the paragraph 51 ratio, not on the basis of paragraph 47a. So in our submission, it little avails the claimants to say he could have decided this case on the basis of a different and, in their submission, broader um, principle. He didn't do so. He decided it on the basis of his freedom to deal principle, as articulated in, in paragraph 51. So, so that canter through the structure of his judgment and also the um, what he regarded as the jurisprudential underpinnings of that, as well as the policy reasons, explains what Lord Hoffman was doing. Um, I can then come to um, the rest of the, their lordships, so starting with Lord Walker. Paragraph 20, 266, page, page 74 of the report. Not only um, he's not only descri describing the ratio of the tort as set out by Lord Hoffman uh, in, t in the terms set used in paragraph 51, interference with a person's liberty or right to deal with others, but he's also, like Lord Hoffman, rooting this in the precedents and in particular Quinn and, we Quinn and Leatham. And that, that being the rationale of the tort. So he's agreeing with um, Lord Hoffman, or rather he's, he's saying Lord Hoffman sees this is the rationale of the tort, it's Quinn and Leatham. And then Lord Walker then goes on to make the comments about control mechanism that we've seen, and at pa paragraph 270, he refers to the test as being set out at paragraph 51. And then in terms which expressly pick up the second sentence, whether the de defendant's wrong interferes with the freedom of the third party to deal with the claimant. So that's the second sentence of paragraph um, 51. So there's no support there for the suggestion that any broader explanation of the ratio might do. Um, that's Lord Walker, Baroness Hale. Paragraph um, 306, we've, we've seen this. There's two, two um, sentences which are important. One was cited by my learned friend and one wasn't. The, the sentence cited by my learned friend was the sentence at um, paragraph 306 at letter G. 
the common thread is striking through a third party who might otherwise be doing business with your target, whether by buying his goods, hiring his barges or working for him or whatever. So that, again, squarely roots this in the concept of the dealings between the third party and the claimant. Um, then she makes a point about um, if this should be expanded, it's for Parliament um, in par at the end of the par paragraph. And then on the next page, pa page 87... The common law need do no more than draw the lines that it might be expected to draw, procuring an actionable wrong between the third party and the target, or committing an actionable... Sorry, I haven't got this. 307. It, no, it's it's a page 87, I'm sorry. The top of page 87, right. the end of, um, tail end of 306. Yes. So then she says, procuring an actionable wrong. So that was the first of my three elements of the tort. tort against the third party inhibiting his freedom to trade with the target. So she describes the, um, the, the core of the tort as residing in the, the first of the two limitations, actionability and then the interference with the, the third party's freedom to trade with the target. And that second, that, that passage at the top of 87 was just, that wasn't cited by my learned friend, which is why I wanted to just draw your attention to it. So that's Baroness Hale, and then Lord Brown, um, page uh, page ninety one, paragraph three hundred and twenty. We've seen the start of that um, on at the end of page ninety one, where he talks about unlawfully interfering with a third party's freedom to deal with him. What you didn't, look, um, what what you weren't taken to, although you might have read on anyway was over the page, page 92 at the top, he again draw this, draws this back explicitly to the origins of the tort as described by Lord Lindley and Quinn and Leatham. And he says that this is consistent with the great bulk of authority which has considered the tort over the ensuing sen uh, century. And then he makes this point, which is an, uh, an important one. Um, this whole area of economic tort has been plagued by uncertainty for far too long your lordships now have the opportunity to give it a coherent shape and um, this is an opportunity to be taken. So, in our submission, it's clear not only from Lord Hoffman's judgment, but also from the um, speeches of the remainder of the majority that a, a crucial element of the tort and part of the ratio is an interference in the third party's freedom to deal with the claimant. And that was the basis on which the specific um, appeal on this point in Douglas and Hello was decided by Lord Hoffman. He didn't decide that on the basis of the 47A um, summary of uh, um, interference with actions in which the claimant has an economic interest. He decided it on the basis that there wasn't an interference with the dealings between the third party and the claimant. And um, insofar as it is still suggested, there is nothing in any of the judgments to suggest that there's two categories of cases and two potential different ratios being set out here. So um, that's OBG. Now, I wanted to say something about frozen value. Um, and my learned friend touched on it, and I... I think I would like to go to this because although um, my learned friend said the proposition is uncontroversial, what we get out of frozen value is that something quite different was going on on there. Um, because he, he is saying one can get out of frozen value the proposition that because it should have been sufficient to decide the case on a different principle... Um, your Lordship should find that 51 was essentially Oberton. Um, and frozen value doesn't support that proposition. This is a this is a um, authorities bundle one, tab six. You didn't really sort of go into this case at all. No, but I think I need to to explain why what because I mean he has he has cited it um, and he's referred to it in his skeleton. Our argument, and and he he seems to be making the same propositions to you today. So I think we just need to, to see what was actually being said in that case. And this was a a, a, a point, case about a a very um, specific point of construction of the Landlord and Tenant Act. And I don't need to get into great deal as to what the point of construction was, but a very 
broad summary, um, there were several previous Court of Appeal cases which had set out a, a rather general proposition about the application of, um, of a section of that Act. And the general proposition was that um, a landlord could oppose a new t lease for a tenant if it had been the landlord for a period of five years in total, even if the precise nature of the landlord's interest had changed during that time. And the whole basis for this was stopping a landlord from, from coming in and booting out a tenant with very little notice. So there was a, re a five year requirement. But the point being made in the previous cases, which were um, then argued to be binding on the court in this case, was that you could aggregate periods in which you were a landlord in a slightly different capacity as long as it was five years in total. Now, the problem was that in Frozen, a particular issue arose that hadn't been the subject of any argument in the previous cases. And the question was whether you had to be a competent landlord as defined by um, uh, the Act for the whole of the five-year period. And that question hadn't arisen in either of the previous cases. The question had been arisen as to what happens if you're a different sort of landlord for five years, but not do you have to have been a quote-unquote competent landlord for all of that period. And the majority of the Court of Appeal said um, in Frozen that because that particular point hadn't been argued and discussed, um, the broader proposition in the earlier cases could be distinguished and wasn't binding on them. And I think the one um, the paragraph that sets this out quite clearly is paragraph 116 in the judgment of Lord Justice Lloyd. where he says, I'm unwilling to decide that Artemiou's case is a binding precedent on a point which was not argued in that case, which did not arise on the facts of that case, and was not referred to in the judgment as, e as being even potentially relevant. So that was the point. And the reason why that really doesn't have any bearing on this case is that in this case, the particular point that is disputed is the interference with dealing requirement. And that did arise on the facts of OBG, and it was explicitly discussed in OBG, and it was the basis for the disposal of the appeal in Hello in OBG. So Hello, as, as you've seen, it was a case where there was no interference with dealings. And that was the basis for this Lord Hoffman's disposal of that case, and with, with which the majority of the House of Lords agreed. So this case is not one akin to the frozen situation where a broad proposition was stated without a discussion of perhaps unintended consequences. But we have a case in OBG where a very specific proposition was stated, and it was intended to do to apply to this case. So while my learned friend would like to use Frozen to say, let it go, to paragraph 51, this case doesn't support that argument. <laughs> what, he's, what he's really saying is that your lordship should let go the second sentence of 51 because Lord Hoffman could have decided the case on the basis of a different principle, the 47A principle. But the short answer to that is he, he did decide the case on the basis of the 51 principle. And that's a binding decision, even if my learned friend would have preferred him to adopt a different analysis. So I think that, that really deals with the last point in my learned friend's submissions on, on the pre presidential effect. Um, so this isn't a case one can say that the, the point wasn't discussed, it was. Um, now, the remainder of my submissions um, are then deal with the authority since OBG. What time would you like me to stop? Because I can stop here, or I can... You can carry on from there. Okay. So, um, I was going to then look at Emerald, um, Elite and Barclays, NHS Luton and, and the AI case, but I can take them fairly shortly. Um, so, Emerald is, um, is at, power, um, at Authorities, tab, um, Volume 1, Tab 5.
and the relevant passage um, we've looked at, and I want to deal with my learned friend's submissions, that this somehow supports their case. Um, the relevant passage is at paragraph 128 and 129. As my learned friend has explained, this was, an, this was another case where, the, where there was a strikeout application in relation to the pleading of unlawful means. And what happened in the Court of Appeal, um, as is described in this judgment, was that the case turned on the issue of intent. And it was on that basis that the Court of Appeal decided that the unlawful means claim should be struck out. So that was the, what I've said, that it's the third of the three elements of the tort. And the Court of Appeal deals with that at paragraphs 131 and, um, and, and following. But before it dealt with the intent argument, the Court started off by setting out the overall test for the tort. And that's what it's doing at um, paragraph 128 in particular. Um, and refers again to, to this reflecting the rationale as explained at, um, by Lord Lindley and Quinn and Leatham. So again, tying this back into the rationale of the tort. And my learned friend accepts that the passage at the start of 128 is, is not um, supportive of his case. But what he says is then 129 somehow is. And I, I don't un understand that because what the court is saying at paragraph 129 is, well, we're, we're doubtful whether the interference with dealing requirement can be satisfied. But this issue is not directly before us, and we didn't hear any de detailed argument about it, so it would be wrong to express any concluded view. If anything, this is rather like Lonroe. They meant, in this case, because they have OBG and Allen, they mention the requirement, but they say, well, it's not been argued, so we can't, we can't strike out the case on that basis. So, so that, was, um, that was why the point wasn't dispositive of the case in Emerald. It doesn't support my learned friend's case. And nor, does 100, nor is 128 set out as being a, a statement of the principle for licensing cases. This, this wasn't a licensing case. This was a case where there, um, where there was a, 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 um, a relevant public authority. And that is why the Court of Appeal expressed doubt that the, um, the, the dealings requirement would have been satisfied in that case. So that, we say, is squarely supportive of our submission, although we entirely accept it was obiter because the case was decided on the basis of the intention requirement. Um, Elite and Barclays, um, uh, I don't really need, need to go to, um, my learned friend has accepted that, albeit a first instance authority, it's one where the judge relied on the ratio as being as at paragraph 51, um, he applied it without any hesitation um, in in that case, um, and and that was one of the ba one of the bases of the judgment in Elite. It wasn't an obiter statement. Oh, so I'm just making. So I'm just. Uh, we can look at Elite, but I was just. Um, no, I really want to. No. Elite, point Elite this? and Barclays. Yeah, just from, from uh, my point of making. So the judge. This was a first instance case where the judge referred to paragraph 51 of um, OBG as the ratio yes. of that case yes. and applied it. Right. And that was one of the bases on which he decided the case. And just for your Lordship's note, this uh, the elite case did go on appeal to the Court of Appeal, but by that time the claimant had abandoned this, this part of its pleaded case. Right. So the claimant then no longer pursued the case after the unfavourable judgment below. And for your Lordship's reference, the Court of Appeal judgment is at two, um, the, the neutral citation number is 2019 EWCA um, CIV 204. Um, and the fact that the unlawful interference claim was no longer pursued is recorded at paragraph three of the judgment of Lady Justice Asplin. So that, that then wasn't pursued after, uh, after the um, finding against the, um, the claimants below on that aspect of their case. Um, Luton, I don't, um, I don't think I need to go to because that's another case in which the ratio of the um, OBG was referred to as being paragraph 51. And, um, and, and all that the judge was saying was, um, was that um, 
he thought that because of Lord Walker had commented that this wasn't the last word on the matter, that he shouldn't rule out the claim on this basis, that he had accepted that 51 was the ratio, but thought that things might move on. And he noted that by that time, this was 2014, so it was before either Emerald or Elite, um, chronologically, he said that there'd been no other cases cited to him that had, had referred to OBG. But of course, after that came Emerald and Elite, both of which cited OBG and referred to and applied paragraph 51. Um, but well, in any event... After Rothschild's decision, I'm sorry. No, so, so chronologically, um, Elite... Uh, so Emerald was 2015, Elite was 2017, NHS Luton was 2014, um, and, and I referred to it in that order because he said nothing had been cited to me by that point that relies on OBG. But actually, we now know that there's several cases since OBG that do do refer to the judgment. Um, but in so far as he in so far as he was saying, ah, oh, it, it is the late. I understand it's the late um, Charles Pearl. Uh, Charles, Charles Pearl's case. Pearl QC. Right. So yeah, you're, yes. you're now referring to Charles again. He's on, a judge, he's on a judge Pearl QC's decision in, in the Luton case. In the Luton case, right, yes. Sorry, yes. Right. Thank you. Um, so the only point you're making about Luton well, is, he, he, is, is, is that there were, in fact, cases subsequent. I'm making several points. One, he correctly identified the ratio as being 51. There's no suggestion that the ratio was something else. And two, um, he, he, he said... He hadn't been referred to any other decisions since then. There have now been decisions since then, in so, for what it's worth. The third point about the Luton case is that insofar as he decided not to um, decide the case on this point because the case law might develop further, and that was the point that he made by reference to Lord Walker, um, in our submission that was wrong. So that's the domestic cases. Um, I, uh, I can take very shortly the Canadian case. Um, to just one point about that, which is that um, the Supreme Court correctly, we say, identified the ratio of the case as being paragraph 51. Again, no, um, my learned friend uh, described this as a curate's egg, and that's, that's why, because the Canadian su Supreme Court didn't suggest that the ratio is 47. It, it, it agreed that the ratio was 51. And the judge said, well, he would prefer limiting the, the scope of the tort in a different way. But that's really by the by. That's not for this court. That's a debate to be had if it ever gets there um, in the Supreme Court. Yes. Legal policy. Yes. And that, that was the, the bulk of what my learned friend yeah. took you to in relation to, um, to, to AI. Um, I can see that you would probably like me to finish today. <laughs> But I, I, if you're not going to be much longer, you might as well finish today. You're not going to be much longer. How much longer are you going to be? I think maybe another 10 or 15 minutes. But then, I, but then my, my learned friend's got his reply, and so we're going to have to be back tomorrow. So I don't think we can actually finish the case if it, today. If, if, if it remains 10 to 15 minutes tomorrow, I'll be happy. What I don't want to say <laughs> is the 10 or 15 minutes now to become an hour tomorrow. No, it's not going to be an hour tomorrow. I, I, think, I've, I, I think I have got... Um, Yes, no, I have I've got less all the authorities now. I've dealt with all... The, I, I, I wanted to sweep up a few of the other authorities I haven't discussed. So what I want to do tomorrow is deal with Newman and Zachary very quickly, Barrett's and Baird, um, National Phonograph, which I think I haven't dealt with. I can deal with them quite quickly. And then I want to... My, the last of my headings was the public policy considerations, which might go, um, or might largely go, if the public authority point is no longer pursued. And I also want to touch on Willers and Joyce, which is the, the malicious um, so we'll say half prosecution. An hour, right? No more than half an hour tomorrow. No more than half an hour. And what about you, Mr. Crow, tomorrow? Um, I very much doubt I'll be more than... I, I, I usually am very short in reply, and I can't imagine I'll be more than 15, 20 minutes. Very grateful. Very grateful. We will start again tomorrow at 10.30. 10 <laughs> Thank you.